we're going to talk about safe ground for learning. Um, a safe ground for learning is my interpretation of this difficult translation between social design in one uh, aspect and sustainable development, development in the other. And I think already in a panel debate before, this relation and transfer between two worlds was discussed. And I think it's indeed a challenge. It's a super important um, a field to work on, but it's a challenging one as well. I was um, first, I will quickly introduce myself. I was um, announced as someone based in Leuven. That was indeed true. But over time, I also shifted and moved to places. And now I think it's mo mainly Antwerp and Zurich where I'm playing a role. Um, and Antwerp is based on the office I have there, which is called Endeavor. It's an office for social spatial innovation where we support local governments to develop strategies and perspectives to deal with complex transformations. So it's from designing alternative development models for kind of marginalized programs uh, to creating really local alliances um, around climate policies, developing tools to trigger discussion around housing preferences, et cetera, et cetera. I'm working there as a, as a sociologist and um, I'm also um, uh, an urban planner and ur urban designer. We're a team of around nine people, let's say. Um, the other role of the last one and a half year is the role I play at uh, ETH Zurich, um, where I'm the kind of uh, research coordinator of the chair of architecture and urban transformation. And I think with this chair, we really try to play a role in this tension field between social design and sustainable development. We try to understand and engage um, how the process behind transformation and urban transformation actually plays out. And how it also finds um, its shape within these different European contexts. And how designers can start to intervene um, to really um, kind of strengthen um, this process of transformation. The chair is a place for reflection and action where we investigate a new culture of design. And I think that relates already to the comments of Gerard Barth, this need for a culture of design um, that stresses the need for dealing with diversity, finding the right moments to collectively learn and cherish the power of creativity, not only as a synthesizing power, because I think that's often seen as the main power of creativity, but also as a kind of an attitude to learn you how to deal with and introduce a kind of a configurational mode of thinking. So a way to creatively position elements from a little letter, a little note to a big new museum and see how this kind of new composition can trigger our capacity as a society to adapt to new conditions. Because I think we all agree that this need for social design and the need for adaptation is at the center of current things. Um, so this mode of thinking brings us indeed back to social design and the importance of this field for current architectural and urban practice. And I think a large variety of projects show how social design in all, all its variety plays an important role, but often an important role behind the scenes, an important role to create the right conditions for change uh, to happen. And I'll just go through a couple of examples to make um, this statement uh, a bit more clear. The first project is a project, project um, by Endeavor. So my office, where a couple of years ago, we decided to buy the Audan together. It's the building you see at the back of this image. It's one of the three historical towers of the city of Antwerp. It's modernist heritage, but it was put it for sale by the city for the highest bidder. So purely in, let's say, capitalist reasoning. And we decided to use this moment to start campaigning for more cooperative modes of development and find ways to rethink several mechanisms of real estate development. And this whole process was a process beyond architecture. It was just not just about creating big visions about the tower, but it was about experimenting with kind of more open source models to show the audience, to show the, the citizens of Antwerp, the logics of real estate and help them to start imagining different scenarios. We started to create and define a future of the building, not by developing big narratives um, on the potential of the site, but by activating actors, possible programs and communicating their wish, which then at the end became this kind of new configuration of practices and, 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 and actually the, the, the the place itself became already a place 
in the imaginaries of the cities and the way we talked about it, just through these practices. Um, so different tools of social design were there at the core to tackle existing and activate new forms of real estate development, you could say. Another example is also in Antwerp, the dry docks in Antwerp. It's a, an old industrial site for ship repair where Endeavour and 51 and 4E, an architectural office from Brussels, uh, were asked by the local government to develop a plan and think about how to include cultural programs here in this former industrial um, site and heritage site in the city. And of course, these new claims of culture and heritage, say they needed to be combined with existing and future economic fabric and, and, and also keep the identity of that place as a kind of a certain free zone in the city until now. Uh, let's say it was a place where I, I kissed my first girlfriend. So it's, it's this kind of places where, where you can sneakily do things and, and go to and, and, and feel free and feel open. And I think we all acknowledge that these places are super crucial for a city to be a city. Um, but if you then start to have these questions of reprogramming that site, that yeah, there is a, it's quite a challenging job and there is a possibility that um, one of the other programs will be more dominant, let's say. So again there, I think it's the challenge was to go beyond the imagination of the ideal situation, but already start to combine the programs throughout our research and really try to find um, how one or the other program could or will dominate the other one. And, and I start to negotiate that process already from the beginning. So it was a pro project where we not only use design to imagine futures, but also to rethink the way we deal with ownership, the rethink the way we deal with safety instructions, for instance, of not falling in the water and how to deal with it. And how that, does that relate to cultural activities or this free zone? It was um, the, uh, a design process where we try to to create an alliance of actors that could slowly transform this place and at the same time learn from each other. But I think, because I think that was the most important thing from us that we wanted to slow down the transformation in a way, because we had the impression that if we want, were going to quickly, just quickly implement it, that the more stronger actors would probably um, define the whole future. So design became more and more a mode of asking the right questions, you could say, providing frameworks to deal with time and complexity, and also to show how new configurations of places and activities um, have the possibility to trigger um, opportunities. And these kind of approaches work on this very concrete scale, but actually also on a larger urban scale. They are equally important on big development uh, scales. And here is an example of the North District in Brussels, a neighborhood which was purely built on the logics of financial real estate and office development based on the grid of modernist planning, which created kind of the perfect place to really go for this multi or not multi monofunctional uh, destination. It was leaving no room for adaptivity or finding ways to make this play, place more urban shared and also to give something back to the city it belongs to. Um, and a, a same type of environment was discovering of the Ring Road in Antwerp, which was a massive infrastructure project and still is that deal with the growing traffic around the city and the need to respond to the growing problems of air and noise pollution. And also the use, huge potential to use this project to restore several social and ecological systems like water and close neighborhoods, etc. Both projects are, if social design is not part of it, are possible projects which um, really go um, kind of uh, go forward based on the logic of engineering, of solving problems, and even in the, the framework of sustainable development, but through this kind of, let's say, monolithical approach, forgetting about the little sensitivities of a place. And I think um, that was the way we engaged with both these areas, so again, in collaboration with 51 and 4E. In the Brussels project, we tried to um, kind of um, include this more sensitive understanding of a place by experiencing, by testing, by programming the North East, by living there, by sleeping there um, in the building. And again, by introducing new actors to that area and slowly, slowly, and that's really beautiful to see, uh, we could 
in one way or another start to involve also these real estate developers and start to open up a world for them which they couldn't imagine before um, and which they could only imagine by really experiencing together with us because it's created the climate of trust let's say to rethink existing practices and i think um, the same was the case of the ring road in antwerp where it was through a very precise description of places and how they were experienced today and how they were used in kind of everyday reality that we could be precise enough to really um, tackle uh, kind of this bigger infrastructural agenda and make it productive and, and include a more sensitive approach. So I think for all this process, social design played a crucial role. It created the conditions to rethink uh, existing practices and help the people involved to also develop their capacity to adapt. And as I said before, I think we all agree that this capacity is crucial in current times of uncertainty. And I think that's for me really the reason why social design is that um, important. But and here I come to the second part of my presentation, including social design in this kind of practices of urban transformation is also often hard. It's challenging and it's disruptive for a lot of existing practices. For the ring project, for instance, this covering of the ring, it took 20 years and I was part of that movement to shape the right conditions to protest and to shape the right conditions to include social design and start rethinking infrastructure, not as only a big investment in concrete, but also an investment in the city. For the North District uh, example I gave, it was only through this kind of close networks and endless series of rituals and agreements that we could create that trust to really start imagining together. For the Ardan even, we never realized, we never could buy that building at the end um, because different financial procedures were too resistant for change uh, to include social design as a real um, change maker. And I think that opened up my mind that um, in all these projects, there seemed to be a kind of certain fear to engage with social de design, to allow complexity to take over and engage with our capacity to adapt. And it's actually not that surprisingly, because I think social design, if really taken seriously, is a challenging process. It questions the way we organize things. It talks about responsibility. It highlights differences. It creates a kind of a mode of discomfort and also rethinks power. And not everybody wants that. No, not everybody wants to engage in that risky business. And I, I think it's crucial to realize this. I think it's crucial to understand that even if the need for social design is more and more broadly supported, the actual threshold, threshold to engage with these processes is still high. And I think it's important to understand that the outcome of a process of social design won't be enough to convince people to participate. I think we need to go into kind of the social psychological aspects of transformation and really need to embrace and embed them in uh, our design uh, approach. And that's um, what I call um, this kind of safe ground for learning, the title of my presentation. So there is need for safe ground of, of, uh, for learning and it's not, and I think that's important, but because safe ground is often seen as a way to kind of neglect conflict. That's not the thing that I'm um, um, aiming for. For me, it's a, um, a, a way to allow conflict, but as a practice to help a collective um, to on the one moment challenge modes of power and control, and on the other hand, uh, help a collective to develop a capacity for reflexivity. And you can start to trace certain dimensions to make that a bit more operational. And you can say, okay, challenging modes of power and control is about including uncertainty in your process, be really specific about it, not claiming that you will control everything as from the start. It's about including amateurism, the non-professional, the non-existing practices in uh, your moment, uh, in your process. As Endeavor, we often call ourselves senior improvisers. Um, it's about accepting slowness as a key asset to kind of also break existing practices of control because i think by doing things quickly uh, you're quickly also going into the existing mode of thinking and reasoning and there are people in control are always better in that if you look at the developing a capacity for reflexivity and um, then it's about questioning 
um, how we can strengthen a, a culture of collaboration. Because for instance, in the university, I'm part of at ETH Zurich, it's crazy how competition is still the norm in architectural education. The second one is about positionality, help people to speak up, going into a kind of a consequential mode of reasoning, understanding what is the consequence of my action and be clear about it. And it's also about self-management, letting loose hierarchical structures. And for me, this is a kind of an ongoing research is trying to find the form, because this is still a theoretical concept, trying to find the form of this kind of um, safe ground for learning. And I'll, to conclude, I'll give you a set of examples, um, which um, I'm currently experimenting with, which are for me these kind of possible forms of safe ground for learning. But it's also an invitation to all of you to maybe now grab a piece of paper and a pencil and start to imagine your own safe grounds for learning. And, and, and please send them to me, uh, because I would be really curious to, to see them. Um, I'll, I'll uh, provide you with my email at the end of this presentation, and maybe over years we can start to collect uh, this, this big variety of safe grounds for learning, which then could trigger and inspire um, practices of social design for the future. So I think I have another three, four minutes left. I'll just go through quick examples of my imagination of safe grounds for learning. The first one is theatrical grounds. This is the Design in Dialogue Lab, the lab we created one and a half year, years ago in Zurich uh, to completely change the environment of architectural students, the environment of a studio, to go beyond kind of excelling in model making but to learn students to speak up, to learn students to create a theoretical configuration, to change the atmosphere of a, of a, of a setting and of a place and help them to really um, discover their own creative potential and also their potential to collaborate. And this is, it's amazing how it's working. How just letting people experiment with curtains, with light, with configurations of a space, how that really opens up and gives them also the possibility to, to design better in a way. And we are also using it to include external peoples and really develop and debate existing projects. Another one is discur discursive grounds. It's another uh, possible interpretation of the safe ground for learning. And over the last years, we're more and more experimenting with the form of letters as a way to open discussion. We're writing letters to our students, to our colleagues, and we're asking them to write back. This is our way of communicating and it helps because it, it, it creates a clear format where you can position yourself, where you can define a, a mode of reasoning, but it also allows the other to take the time, to have their time to define their ideas, to position again and respond. And I think this is really helping and working. Another, you want to say something or? No, okay, another <laughs> example is uh, interpretation is shared grounds. It's, this is an, an example of a value framework we're often developing at the Dry Docs in Antwerp, for instance. It's a set of rules and ambitions that became as important as the actual design output of the project and helped to preserve a kind of a mode of taking care of each other and that make sure that each of the actors that were involved in the process will also have a role in the future of it. A fourth one or third interpretation could be a kind of the organizational grounds. And here, this is a picture and an image of the whole organizational structure that we set up um, for Endeavor. It's a cooperative and that allowed us to constantly have enough room for maneuver. 